So first off, Dr. Ross, why don't you just begin by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, both educationally and vocationally, where you're at now, what you're up to now. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm a political scientist by training. Uh, That's the uh, discipline in which I earned my PhD. But uh, early in my professional career, I discovered that my scholarship best fit into the fields of criminology and criminal justice. Uh, More importantly, I preferred hanging out with criminologists more than I did with political scientists. Uh, That being said, I've had a number of life experiences that made me better suited to be a criminologist. And uh, I I joke with people uh, that uh, while growing up, about a third of my friends became lawyers, another third were criminal justice practitioners, mainly police officers, uh, and that the balance were uh, criminals. So um, it was and has been sort of a symbiotic relationship. And uh, like the famous author uh, M. Scott Peck argued, I, I took the uh, the road less traveled. Um, so that uh, you know basically uh, describes you know my my background. Um, and I, I gravitated towards corrections because uh, of the following things. And, and that is, um, uh, I worked close to four years in a correctional facility. Uh, and I swore that on the day that I left the job and uh, started initially a master's program and then later a PhD that I'd, I'd never set foot in a correctional facility in any shape or capacity again. But uh, here I am several years later doing research on uh, correctional facilities, uh, the people who are incarcerated there, uh, the people who work there, and trying to help people, trying to help convicts and ex-convicts find a voice for their work, uh, for their struggles, uh, and to make some noticeable changes in the correctional system in the United States and elsewhere, helping other people to understand uh, prisons, uh, the people who are incarcerated there, uh, and uh, how to, how to go about reforming the system. Tell us all about what is convict criminology, as you put it. Sure. How did, that, how did convict criminology really get started? Right. Okay. Well, uh, convict criminology. Convict criminology is um, a, uh, it, it's a kind of a marriage in many respects. Um, it is a uh, approximately in the 1990s. Um, I, uh, uh, along with uh, uh, Steve uh, Richards, a uh, uh, now retired uh, criminologist, we, we came up this, uh, with this idea of, of, of convict, criminolo- convict criminology. It's interchangeably called a group or a movement or an organization, sometimes called a school, sometimes called a theory. Um, it was primarily a network or a platform that was united in the perception that the uh, convict voice had been neglected or minimized in scholarship and in policy debates and criminal justice in general and corrections in particular. It's mainly for individuals who are either incarcerated or formerly incarcerated who have a PhD or they're in the process of working on a doctorate in the field of criminal justice or criminology or an allied field. Uh, it also includes people who are just in Im- justice impacted, uh, prison activists who share our mission, uh, who are also in the uh, possession of a PhD or in the process of earning one. The next logical question that you might ask me or others might ask me and, and people who subscribe to the convict criminology um, you know, idea is, you know, why the PhD? Why is that necessary? And, and, and I'll tell you why. And that is, uh, you know, clearly there's a lot of articulate convicts and ex-convicts who have unique insights uh, and a lot of interesting things to be- say about crime, criminal justice, the prison system, etc. But er- earning a PhD from an accredited university uh, in the field of criminal criminal justice or criminology or, or an allied field means that, or generally means that you can critically analyze the field of corrections in a scientific manner. Um, so. Those are the that's that's the background. That's the 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 uh, long the long long play version. Yeah, and I love I, I love the spirit of what you're trying to do there, what you are doing there. I, regular listeners of the show know that I I enjoy having folks on with lived experiences. In fact, just last week I spoke with a gentleman by the name of Gethin Jones over in the UK, and 
at a point he was talking about how, and he's a desisted individual, that he was on a design team for some correctional program uh, over in England. And I said to him, you know, Gethin, I've been in community corrections for 30 plus years, and I don't know if I've ever had somebody with lived experiences on any design team for any project that I've ever been involved with, which if you apply that to other areas of our life is just mind boggling that you wouldn't get a patient's voice or a student's voice or a, or a, or a customer's voice or, or anything like that. So, um, yeah, that is exactly. fantastic. That's a, sure. That's important. Yeah. And, but also to keep in mind that just because somebody has, and I, mm -hmm. I had a blog post that I, that, uh, uh, I, uh, published a, a few weeks back and it, and it dealt with this issue of lived experience. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, uh, to keep in mind that just because somebody has lived experience doesn't necessarily mean a that they can articulate uh, what happened to them uh, to others uh, or that their insights are necessarily unique um, so uh, let's not assume uh, let's 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 uh, assume that it's important uh, but that not everybody who has that qualification, uh, can 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 be helpful, and right. I think part of part part of what we try to do is we try try to assist people who have that lived experience, uh, you know, tap into those unique experiences that they have and communicate them to the to the wider public, particularly the criminology community. And so maybe that was an answer to my next question, which was how does convict criminology accomplish its goals? Right. Well, certainly what I what I mentioned is part mm -hmm. of it, but there are really three broad. Um, areas where convict criminology works. And the very first one is producing scholarly research. The second is through mentorship. And the third is through activism uh, or uh, public policy work. And let me uh, riff if I can for a few seconds on, on each one, unless you, uh, unless you want me to stop there. Uh, from, from the very beginning, we've been committed to conducting scholarly research and bringing that research to the attention of academics, to students, to policymakers. And so what that means is uh, attending uh, scholarly conferences, presenting papers on panels at those venues, subjecting our research to peer review. And uh, through that process over the past 25 years or so, uh, we've produced a number of articles, uh, chapters in academic uh, books, scholarly books that explore different aspects of convict criminology and, and subjects of interest to the CC uh, community. Um, and so um, early on in that whole trajectory, uh, after we held a, a series of panels at the American Society of Criminology, we co-edited a book called Convict Criminology, the book that uh, you have on your shelf there, and it was a peer-reviewed book uh, published by Wadsworth back in 2003, and it had contributions by professors who were uh, justice-impacted, uh, folks who had been behind bars, who had been released, who earned uh, PhDs. It also had uh, people who uh, were uh, activists who were also had PhDs, uh, and that uh, selected chapters of that book are still in use uh, in, in classroom uh, context. Uh, last year, uh, Francesca Vianello, uh, an Italian scholar, and I uh, had a book published uh, called uh, Convict Criminology for the Future, and that's also the result of a conference that was held uh, in 2019 in Padua, Italy, and there includes contributions from formerly incarcerated uh, professors, a couple of graduate students, and people who are very connected to the convict criminology uh, network. In terms of mentorship, um, you know, established uh, members of uh, convict criminology have formerly, well, have met, mentored formerly incarcerated uh, and justice impacted undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, we've assisted graduate students in the scholarly research process. Uh, how do we do that? We uh, conduct research with them. We publish with them. We present uh, papers on panels with them. Uh, we publish articles in peer-reviewed journals with them. We provide opportunities for them by uh, having them publish chapters in scholarly books. Um, basically, what we try to do is show them the ropes of uh, research and uh, teaching and being a good citizen as a professor in a uh, department of criminology, criminal justice, or sociology. Um, as you may know, is the, the university is, uh, is difficult to navigate at best of times, and having a, a criminal conviction or multiple convictions 
plus the time spent behind bars makes it very difficult for a person uh, initially A, to get a job, and then uh, B, to survive uh, graduate school, and then uh, if they want to become professors, secure an appropriate job, excel in the field, that sort of thing. There's a lot of unstated things that happen in academia that professors, junior professors encounter, and we kind of, we try to deconstruct them, na help mm -hmm. them navigate the way, that sort of thing. Uh, the last part is uh, activism. So uh, in addition to that scholarship and mentorship, we uh, uh, we, we try to uh, uh, participate on uh, boards that exi exist, uh, you know, uh, uh, community, regional, statewide, national panels that examine or monitor issues that are important for convicts, that sort of thing. Uh, many of us will teach classes inside prisons, and we see that uh, as uh, as uh, mentoring, as part of mentoring, as part of activism, that sort of thing. Why do you feel educated convict voices have been silenced for so long, Jeff? Um, well, um, I think there has been, well, the, the uh, to begin with, a, a lot of people uh, coming out of prison um, don't naturally go um, into getting a Ph.D., Mm -hmm. uh, and then very few of them uh, have chosen to work at universities. Um, and I think there's also a bit of a bias uh, against uh, people who have criminal backgrounds. Uh, but uh, over the past two decades, universities have been uh, more accepting of people who have criminal convictions. So there's a lot more tolerance for people who've had criminal convictions. But it's 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 we're. we're um, uh, we're not at a place right now where there's total uh, acceptance. I mean, we've had to battle things like, uh, uh, you know, the box that you check on an application form uh, to be uh, first a you know undergraduate, graduate student, or even being an employee of a university. Um, but uh, through you know the collective efforts of many people in different states who participated in a sort of a ban the box program. It's become easier. Um, those are those are uh, those are some of the reasons why I think the uh, there's been some fear and apprehension among uh, criminologists who aren't justice impacted uh, about people with criminal convictions, and, and that's uh, uh, something that convict criminologists have had to had to battle in the past. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure listeners are wondering, what does that look like for somebody to earn their PhD behind bars? How do how do convicts earn their PhD behind bars? Yeah, well, that's that's an important question, it's, and it's a great question. Um, and um, to begin with, it's very difficult to earn a PhD behind bars. Um, and we have people who are uh, affiliated with the group who. Um, uh, are uh, had a PhD and then they uh, they uh, had a conviction and then they went to uh, to jail or to prison um, and we also have people who uh, maybe had some undergraduate classes um, under their belt before they went to prison uh, and while in prison, they were able to take some correspondence classes or some classes via some sort of video linkage link up behind bars. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, earning a doctorate is near impossible from an acc accredited university uh, behind bars. So so um, that's why majority of them, uh, what they do is they do things in preparation uh, of getting a PhD when they come out. We advise people who are Considering that track to to take notes, uh, to observe, uh, to co-author with us, and that when they come out, we write letters on their behalf so that they can get into a bachelor's, master's, or PhD program, depending on which uh, degree that they completed before um, before going in. Um, and uh, those are some of the things that we've, okay. we've done. Yeah. I, uh, I I personally always bristle when, regardless of the uh, of the topic, I hear someone say, "Well, the science is settled on this, Joe," and it's like, "Well, science by definition is never settled." Um, how can convicts and formerly incarcerated people challenge past 
research findings? Right. Uh, well, uh, much of the scholarly research uh, in the field of uh, corrections, particularly over the past uh, four years, has been uh, quantitative based on secondhand research. And uh, so, uh, what's wrong with that? And, and although I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying things here, is, is quantitative research frequently assumes that the findings that uh, are generated uh, apply to every correctional institution and everybody who is incarcerated, everybody who works behind bars. And that's simply not true. Uh, and um, quantitative research often is not understood by policymakers and the public, uh, depending upon how you frame it, and communicate it, that sort of thing. And quantitative research can miss uh, subtle dynamics. It, it, it lacks the immediacy of what's going on in the cells, on the tiers, uh, in the wings of correctional facilities. So, but anyone who's done time and studied corrections for a long time knows that uh, no two inmates are the same, no two correctional officers are the same, no two experiences are the same, that sort of thing. No, no, no two correctional facilities are the same. That's why convict criminology pushes for or tries to utilize it, or let's just say the predominant kind of methodology has been qualitative research and in particular autoethnography. Autoethnography, these are uh, descriptive accounts that they try to get their, at the reality and immediacy of what took place behind bars uh, for the people who experienced it. Um, uh, autoethnography is not a perfect kind of research. Uh, it's not telling war stories, although some people think it is. Um, and we found that that approach to understanding convict experience has been most beneficial. That being said is that uh, a lot of other types of methodology are now being experimented with uh, in, in, in the field. Well, it sounds like you've done a lot of great stuff with your convict criminology movement. What's, what's the reception been like from others? Right. Uh, well, uh, there's been a considerable amount of curiosity uh, from students and from instructors and from scholars about, you know, just what is convict criminology. Uh, there's also, by the same token, been a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, uh, this includes uh, a lot of unsupported beliefs of that anybody who is articulate and anybody who's done time uh, understands social science and policy research and, and you know, uh, this is simply not the case. Uh, there's also uh, the assumption that uh, everybody, everybody who's been behind bars and has a PhD is familiar with convict criminology and that we can label them a convict criminologist. There are people who have done time, people who have PhDs, uh, but they don't want to be affiliated with our group for one reason or another, and that's fine. But uh, we have to be careful about labeling somebody as a convict criminologist when they have not, uh, when they themselves say, hey, this is not an identity or a perspective that I want to identify with. Uh, there's also uh, some opposition to using the name convict uh, and that we are being somehow insensitive by using the word convict and that we should call people who have. Um, been incarcerated, uh, you know, returning citizens, formerly incarcerated, you know, justice impact, mm -hmm. impacted. And, and there is some discussion not only inside, you know, the network about the appropriateness of still using the word convict and convict criminology. But uh, if you talk to a lot of people who've done time, as I find, and many of the people who are part of this network, is uh, a lot of them don't mind being called uh, convict. They say, hey, listen, I didn't do all this stuff to be called, you know, formerly incarcerated or a returning citizen, that sort of thing. Uh, and just be, uh, just because I'm, I'm now called, you know, a returning citizen or formerly incarcerated doesn't mean that I'm not going to be um, uh, stigmatized. Uh, so just uh, changing the name uh, or changing the label doesn't mean that it changes people's perceptions of people who did time and who served time. 
Yeah, I'm glad you addressed that because I'm sure I'm not the only one, my listeners included, because we talked a lot about, as you just alluded to, Jeff, labeling theory and and the nomenclature we use and getting away from offender and and that type of thing. So thank you very much right. for, for, for teasing that out for us. That was insightful. And again, hearing it from, um, from those individuals themselves. Um, one of the big themes in our show, we talk about desistance. Maybe just kind of talk about the work you're doing and how that overlays with desistance and why augmenting human capital through education and employment, all that kind of thing is just so important for helping somebody on their trajectory, their desistance path, if you will. Right. Well, um, I think that uh, part of the convict criminology uh, ethos uh, network uh, are providing people who've, who've, who've been there, who've done that. They serve as role models for uh, individuals who've done time uh, and they can share similar experiences with people. When, uh, if you can look out into the real world and, and find somebody who, who's been in a similar situation to you, uh, who can kind of show you the ropes, then it's easier for you to make that transition from uh, you know, formerly incarcerated to current student to potentially uh, incoming you know, brand new, uh, you know, uh, tenure track as, uh, assistant professor. Mm -hmm. um, and the more that you get involved in that subculture and leave the old subculture behind, it's easier to desist. That's not saying that we have, we haven't encountered people in our network who, uh, slid back, uh, into, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to, uh, I don't want to use life of crime, but the, you know, there's, there's slippage. Uh, some people have returned to, uh, you know, poly drug use. Uh, some people did not complete their PhDs. Uh, some people for one reason or another, uh, left, uh, academia because of the, 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 the benefits they made that cost benefit calculation. And clearly academia was not a, a profession for them and they preferred working for a social service agency or a government agency uh, they felt that they would get uh, uh, you know better pay better working conditions that they could help more people who were similar to them so um, others had health concerns too so uh, it's not a panacea uh, it's not one size fits all but it is a uh, or attempts to be a supportive network for people who uh, want the help and they want to work hard uh, in, 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 the, in that path. I don't know the answer to this, but if there are people listening who believe in, in what you're doing with that convict criminology network, is there any way they can support or um, what can folks do to kind of get behind the movement there, as we say, with convict criminology? Right. So um, almost this time last year, uh, you know, spring of uh, 2020, uh, the uh, American Society of Criminology approved the formal creation of a division uh, uh, of convict criminology. So uh, one of the best things somebody can do is type in the, uh, on the web uh, division of convict criminology, American Society of Criminology, and reach out to uh, the, uh, there's a contact button there, and they can uh, they can join, uh, or let's say they can get more information about convict criminology and how they can be part of this network. Uh, and that's a major development in, in the trajectory of this network school theory uh, perspective, and, and that is the formalization of uh, of what we're doing. And so, um, and uh, if 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 for one reason or another they do not get any. Uh, a quick response, they can reach out to me and type in my three names, Jeffrey Ian Ross, University of Baltimore, send me an email and I will put them in touch with the uh, uh, appropriate people who can uh, uh, assist them uh, learning more about uh, convict criminology and uh, the American Society of Criminology Division on Convict Criminology. And what I'll do for the podcast in the, in the show notes and the episode notes, I'll leave the aforementioned website that you referenced, and then we can even touch base on leaving your contact information uh, as well. And I'll leave a link to your book as well in the in the episode notes. What's on the horizon for 
Jeff Ross, any projects coming up or any other adventures you're diving into, Dr. Ross? <laughs> um, uh, I laugh only because, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a, a, uh, uh, a book about convict criminology and uh, uh, hopefully that uh, book uh, uh, has uh, uh, some uh, a resonance amongst a, a wider group. The, there's been two, there's been uh, three books uh, published on convict criminology. There's the book Convict Criminology published in 2003. Uh, there's been a sole author book uh, written by uh, Rod Earl on convict criminology. Uh, there's the co-edited book by uh, uh, Francesca Vianello and myself, and uh, uh, I'm trying to put together a, a sole author book on convict criminology myself too. So um, the uh, convict criminology also part participates in a journal called the Pr uh, Journal of Prisoners on Prison, which is based up in Canada. That's a great source for people who have been uh, uh, who are interested in literature that is uh, uh, authored by uh, incarcerated uh, people or formerly incarcerated people, and uh, so that's the kind of networks that I'm uh, interacting with and things I'm doing. Uh, hopefully that does a respectful job responding to your question. It is. It did. You have your hands full. That's for sure. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully you'll come back and give us some updates um, with those projects. In the meantime, I'll continue to spread the gospel of convict uh, criminology. And we thank you for being on the show, Dr. Ross. It's been a pleasure. Uh, likewise. Um, just, uh, let me just say that uh, the work you do and, and the organization you represent uh, are, are, are great. Uh, I wish more qualified people like you and organizations like yours were doing that sort of thing. Um, Thanks for allowing me to share my scholarship and insights with you and your audience. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the kind words. Yeah, exactly. Just trying to get the word out there. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Thanks. Thanks again, Dr. Haas. My pleasure. Take care. Take care.